One chance, one life, one take. Hello and welcome. This is the Dead Funny Dead Serious podcast. My name is Mitzi and I'm the host for the series. The series is 30 End of Life Duels in 30 Days. Today, our guest is Kai Wonder and welcome to the show. Hi, so excited to be here. So glad you're doing this little project, big project. <laughs> uh, it's a little big project, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so glad to have you here. Let's just start. Why did you enter this field? And you can go ahead and say anything you want about your, your business here as well. I got into this field because something happened in my personal world where I was kind of thrown into this Um my mom got diagnosed with stage four cancer in June of 2016, and the doctors gave her 10 months to a year to live. And a little bit of background about me and my mom. She was my bud. She was my first love. Uh, <laughs> um, I always tell people that I liked her and I loved her. You know, it wasn't just that she was my mom. And I was heartbroken and devastated. And one way that I dealt with her dying was I just did a lot of research. I wasn't sleeping a lot that last year of life, her last year of life. I had just moved back to Philadelphia from New Orleans and I moved in with her and we got me and my brother and we got a house with my mom so we could take care of her and take her to all of her appointments. She was doing chemo and she did brain radiation, but um, I was also in my first year of grad school. I'm a social worker by trade, LSW, um, grief therapist as well. Yeah. So in my anxiety of like, oh, shoot, how do I show up for my mom? How do I help this woman that gave me everything that I needed in life? How do I help her have the death that she wants? How do I show up for her? And I stumbled across INELDA, which is the International End of Life Doula Association. Is that the acronym? <laughs> and I just went down this rabbit hole of like, I was also, when I went into, when I was going into grad school, I knew that I wanted to be a therapist, but I didn't know a specialty. I didn't know what populations. I identify as non-binary and trans, and I have ADHD and um, some other mental health stuff. So I thought that I was going to try to focus on that. And then all of this stuff happened where I just started reading about becoming an end-of-life doula, death doula, and I just felt really called to it. And um, I went to the uh, in Elda training up in Buffalo, New York in May of 2017. And I got trained to be a death doula and a little, you know, closure about the mom story. She died at home peacefully with me holding her hand. She had the death that she wanted. We spent a lot of time talking about what she wanted her final chapter to look like and feel like what she wanted the room to, you know, if she wanted candles or lights or flowers, if she wanted us to crawl into bed with her what she wanted us to do at, with her body after she died, we really got into it. And I think we were able to do that because we were so close. And because this stuff, even though it was scary, I knew that it was my kind of final gift to my mom. So that's, that's my personal story, how I got here. And when I did the doula training, and kind of, you know, coming out of the death of my mother, I learned that our culture doesn't teach us how to show up for those who are dying. Our culture doesn't teach us how to grieve. Our culture doesn't give us examples of, you know, how to take care of our loved ones at home so that they can have the death that they want. And that's really why I'm here. I'm here to make death and dying and grief more accessible for other people that are living. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that beautiful story. I do have a picture though. I love to show this picture. It's my favorite picture of me and my mom. Please. Oh, that's me and her on the beach. Beautiful. And that's another thing. You know, Happy. one thing about she was my bud. We always laughed. She was such a goofy person, and we always had those in that picture. You can see that like deep belly laugh where it was like we like were laughing uncontrollably. That happened a lot with her. What a joyful photo of their beautiful mom. Yeah segueing a little bit because you you already said this is your journey on why you got into this field you did some yeah. internet work when when faced with this difficult time yeah you did the Anelda training and you're already going for msw at this time what other trainings or influences did you have on actually hanging a shingle as well as msw which is so important so you have both things. So what leads you or inspires you to hang the shingle as death doula as well as 
your professional life? I tried really hard when I, so uh, when you're going for your MSW, when you're becoming a master of social work, you have to do uh, internships at places. And I tried really hard to get my final year internship at a hospice, but it just wasn't in the cards. So my final year in grad school, I was sought out a hospice here in Philly, and I became a volunteer with them. And I volunteered with them twice a week. And I was going into people's homes. And I was able to, you know, begin to utilize some of the training that we got to be a death doula with them, you know, talking about like, life reviews, talking through people in the family and the people that were dying, talking them through, you know, the anxieties that were coming up uh, in reference to death and all the feelings that come around that, doing some like legacy projects and things like that. So that was really great. It was a really good experience to be in hospice and to just get a sense of what hospice was like, because so oftentimes we work alongside or next to hospice workers. And then I graduated and I got a job working at a hospice. And that was, you know, just kind of extending my experience. And then, you know, I got contacted by a friend who I've been friends with for over a decade, Lori Zaspel. And she made a friend Well, she was she is an MSW and she made a friend, uh, this person, Nikki, uh, who's also an MSW. And she was like, I think we should all start a collective. And I was like, that's great. I wanted to go and do this on my own. But it's so much better to do this collective with other people, because it just, you know, it helps to have more than one brain, more than one heart, more than one pair of legs doing all this stuff. (laughs) Um, So in 2019, we got together. And we started the Philly Death Doula Collective. And part of what happened when we started that is, you know, I think part of what's happening in this field, it's like, you know, the death positive movement is really kicking up right now and death doula and end of life doula and, you know, advanced care directives and advanced care planning and all that stuff is becoming hot topics on the internet kind of, and yeah, like the social media, all those realms it's really, it's really a big thing, right? It's really turning into a big thing. And what we realized is that the collective, the first few years were really just going to be educating the public on kind of what death doulas were, what death doulas do, the work we can do, how we can meet people where we're at. But I think I felt really called, I was actively grieving my mother at this time because she died in 2017. And I wanted to focus on grief. So I started these things, these bi-monthly meetings called Grief Circle. And it's, I got the idea from Francis Weller. He wrote about it in his book, The Wild Edge of Sorrow. I love that book if anybody's into grief and communal grieving and death and dying um, and ancestors and all that. Um, He talks about it in there. It's basically the way that Grief Circle works. It's, you know, it's the most ancient human ritual. We sit Well, now we're on Zoom. I used to have it in my house, which was really sweet. I would make tea and light all these candles but we sit around and, you know, nobody, th- there's only two ground rules. Everything that is said there stays there. So it's confidential. And then the other rule is no advice giving unless people ask for it. So the idea is that this is a safe space for people to come to talk about their grief. Because what I found in my grief is that people tried to fix me. They tried to, you know, tell me there's a silver lining. They tried to say my mom's better off where she was and that's bullshit you know, they tried to say all those cliche hallmark things that is just a part of our culture. And I don't hold those against anybody, but it didn't feel good. You know, I wanted to fall apart. I wanted to be sad. I wanted to cry. And people just kept being like, it's okay. It's going to get better. (laughs) I don't know. I think that's something that if people haven't lost somebody, then they might not know that they might not know that grief is forever. So that's kind of a long, sorry, long-winded answer to, I feel really called to like, yes, I am a death doula and we do take private clients at our collective. But I think for the first few years of this, I'm really trying to focus on grief work. I also recently just got a job at the medical examiner's office here in Philadelphia. Uh, My official title is a bereavement care provider, but I do grief therapy free of charge for people that want it. Working at the medical examiner's office is paid work, but I offer free grief therapy to people, but I get paid. It's like a grant funded position. So that's kind of like what's, that's like the, you know, the merging of everything. We, in the collective, we are really social justice oriented. We are white queer people that understand that we have privilege in this black city. Philadelphia is, I forget the percentage, but it's a predominantly black city. 
we know that we hold privilege and what we're trying to do is, you know, our offerings are all sliding scales. We also offer a lot of stuff free of charge. Grief circle is kind of pay what you can. It's like not a big deal if nobody can pay. We also have the death cafes, which are free of charge. So what we're trying to do with the collective is open these services up for anybody, not just rich white people. Uh, and you deserve to get paid and, and yeah. giving back and being social justice minded is also really important in this work as we're finding more and more. And if you listen to this whole series, you will hear a lot of that because it's community care. So you have a job as a social worker. Yes. You now work for the medical examiner's office and you are in this collective. <laughs> what don't you do? <laughs> I know I'm working on this with my therapist now. <laughs> I also work part-time still at the hospice that I used to work at. <laughs> um, so now I'm just two nights a week on call for hospice, but I like it because it keeps me, I don't know. I, uh, I think eventually this work, death doula work might team back up with hospice if it ever gets evidence-based and if it ever gets, you know, covered by insurance. And I like, I like having my hand in hospice for that reason, just kind of knowing how they do their treatment plans, you know, kind of being on board and how they do their, um, you know, like the integrated care models that they use. But yeah, I do a lot, but it's all work that I love. And that's, I'm so great. Like, it doesn't feel like work, even my day job, you know, I, I call people, I get like, I cold call people and I'm like, Hey, this person just died. I know you don't know me. I'm just introducing myself. If you want free therapy, here I am. Call me back. <laughs> but it doesn't feel like work. It just, I don't know. It feels, it just feels like a calling. So that's helpful. <laughs> yeah, that's the best job to have. The ones that yeah. don't feel like jobs. Like you're giving back something. You're getting something and giving something at the same time. Yeah. All right. We are at challenges and it doesn't sound like having all these things to do is a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> so what are the challenges of being an end-of-life doula? That's a good question. I mean, I think one thing that we have identified as a collective is that, you know, Inelda was a really white training and it was a really straight kind of hetero training from what it looked like. And that's just not the landscape of every community. And I think that coming from that training, it was an immediate red flag, you know, because not only that, like we weren't taught how the body dies if they are not white. All of the pictures in that training were, you know, showing what happens to the skin and what can happen underneath the fingernails and the toes and stuff. And we didn't see, I didn't see images of people that weren't white. And, you know, that is problematic because I don't, we want this collective to represent Philadelphia and right now it doesn't. And what we really want to do is to try to send people who don't look like white people to these trainings so that people can get trained that aren't just white. So I think that that's, that's kind of a one. And we've talked about that in the collective and when we encounter other people that are death doulas as well as trying to, you know, not, I don't want to be a gatekeeper to this. I don't even think there should be trainings, actually. I don't think we should have to pay for this. I think it should just, I mean, this is stuff that, you know, before capitalism, we were just doing for our family and loved ones kind of always across the board. And then everything became a product or something to buy and it all changed. So I think that a challenge is to get, to get this, this work back into the hands of community members. And it feels really hard because we are anti-capitalistic in our collective, but we operate in a capitalistic society. And it's like, so we try really hard to like make things sliding scale affordable and just offer things free of charge whenever we can. I'm looking at ways, how can we, so kind of continuing the question, how can we support having this conversation going forward and actually make it a change and get it back because it is, we're all working in the capitalist system. Mm -hmm. I am, you are, I have sliding scale for my clients and my private practice to make sure that we can all get what we need. Yeah. And how do we put death care back into the hands of the families? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think that we get a lot of inquiries via our, um, our Gmail 
our email account. Just, you know, constantly, like every other day, there's a ton of people emailing us being like, uh, how do I become a death doula? What are some trainings? So we tell people we have did Inelda. And I do think Inelda does have good stuff. I do. I appreciate the kind of, you know, three-step process that they taught us. I do think that they had, who's the guy that started Henry? I think Henry is really great. He did my training. Um, he also wrote a couple really good books that I've enjoyed. So Inelda is not all bad, you know, but so when people come to us, we try to send them to Inelda. We say we went to Inelda. It's good for these reasons. We also like to send people to Going with Grace, Alua Arthur, because she is amazing. But I do wonder if there's something bigger that can be done. Like, I wonder if we can create a network of like a larger collective in like all of us in the country who feel like we want to give this power back to the people in their communities. And maybe we just start this collective and we just make all of these resources free for people. I don't know. Or maybe we start to hold free trainings and have the trainers and have the material be for all different types of people, not just white people. Maybe there's something like that that can happen. I can't take anything else on my plate right now. <laughs> but why? Maybe if somebody just why not? I think I think you have plenty of time to be doing this. <laughs> um yeah, but I wonder if there's something like that or just, you know, creating some type of like I think a lot about mutual aid. Like mutual aid has been such a big thing in this city. I mean, through COVID, through all the George Floyd protests and just all of the black people that continually to be killed by cops. There's just been a lot of mutual aid resources popping up in the city and that is inspiring and I wonder if there's a way that we can take the mutual aid approach to this, which I think we can. Having all yeah. these conversations is definitely planting seeds for me and, and I hope others that are listening to this series. It, there's a need for it and we have to figure out how to address it, but we have to work together because this is not a... It's going to be all of us. It's going to be all 30 of the people and all the other death doulas that we can get. And it's going to take a lot of organizing, but yeah, I do think that's kind of bigger picture next step type stuff that we're thinking about. Is there any other challenges? And I'd like to do anything with working with hospice and being a social worker. I mean, I I'm, I'm briefly mentioned it earlier, and I, I'm thinking, you know, I've kind of panned out and kind of gone back to this macro lens of looking at this challenge question that you've mentioned. And I actually think that a challenge for the entire death doula, end of life doula um, <laughs> collective, I was going to say, <laughs> <laughs> workers, all of us, is that you know, right now people are paying for death doulas out of pocket or it's, you know, people aren't paying for services and they're just being done by other people. Um, but I think one thing that is going to have to happen is there's, I don't know if it has to happen, but I think that it would be helpful if this profession became an evidence-based practice. And I think that because there are a lot of people like even when I go to explain, like a lot of times we're brought into institutions to give educational stuff about what a death doula is. And people are like, what do death doulas do? And it's like, well, we could kind of, I mean, since we're all social workers here at the collective, we kind of take this approach where we meet people where they're at. And we can really, as a death doula, you can do so much. You know, it's not like, it's not, you just do this and you just do that and you just do that. But I do think that if it becomes an evidence-based practice and it is covered by insurance, I think that we will be able to help more people. And I think that that's a challenge of the community at large. It is. It is a challenge. And it's also a controversial challenge on making an evidence-based practice. Yeah. Taking, taking insurance, getting medicalized. And yeah, we are in a catch 20. Yeah. But I think for me, the thing that feels really hopeful about all that is that that's the system that we live in, you know, and I don't see a time that it ends. I'm not saying that it won't, but I do. For me, the, the reason why that avenue is so attractive to me is that I, I really want more and more people to have better deaths. And I want more and more people to have access to 13 months of grief therapy, you know, like I want and that is a thing that comes with when a family member's on hospice. But but yeah, I do understand that it's like, yeah, do we really want that? Do we really, really want to be brought into insurance? I don't know. It does sound like a nightmare, but we would be able to touch more people. So 
It's, and who yeah, knows how far off that is? I don't even know if there's research being done. I contemplated going right into a PhD program to do research on this, but no thanks. <laughs> I'd rather talk to people. <laughs> yeah, add a PhD program to everything that you're doing. And I agree. I love the evidence-based practice over here as well as a therapist. I, I think that that's yeah. super important. It brings authority to the work. And what is what are we taking away from the community base? I, and I, it's not, I have no thought either way. I, you know, yeah. I'm in a neutral mind on that. But at the same time, it's a great conversation to have. But I do think right now the way things are moving is things are you know, moving and they are in the community space of this, you know, like there may be people doing evidence or there may be people doing research and stuff right now, but a lot of the death doula-ing that I see is in smaller, yeah, like communities where people are building those relationships and they're doing the educational stuff. So more and more people are learning about what we do and how we can help people. So who knows if the other part will even happen. And we will see. We're in it and it's going to change. Change is inevitable. So here, here we are doing the work. Yeah. So we are going to roll into what are your hopes? Uh, we kind of covered them, right? Is making sure that this is accessible. But are there other hopes for the field of end of life doula? Hopes for the field. I think I'll start with hopes for the collective and that kind of leads into more hopes for the field. So our hopes and dreams on a three to five year plan for the collective is to open a grief center here in Philadelphia. Um, and to have, uh, I'm working towards becoming an LCSW. I'm supervised now. Um, so I'm going to provide uh, therapy. Lori already provides therapy and Nikki does as well. So we're going to have grief therapy there. We're going to do continue to do death cafes. We're going to continue. We're going to do more and more grief circles and kind of have them grief. The grief circle that I run now is really open-ended. And I think that works for a lot of people. People can drop in. They don't have to, there's no commitment, but we do get a lot of people that keep returning, but we'll have different types of um, grief groups. Maybe ones that are like more educational, more, you know, this five week thing or something like that. I really want to do community grief rituals with our, community here and I really want a community like grief altar garden that's public space so people can I mean I think that's really something that I realized so much after my mom died was there just wasn't any place in public to grieve her to grieve in public without feeling embarrassed or ashamed because I was crying or you know like I want there to be a space and I think that that can be applied to the death doula field too. I, I, I hope that we just keep reaching more and more people. I hope we keep finding, like, I love that. I mean, I kind of, I'm kind of a curmudgeon in this way that I don't really like popular things. And I'm kind of like half annoyed that death positivity is so popular, <laughs> but it's also, I'm also going to stop being that curmudgeon. I'm just like a grandpa some days. Um, but I also know that that's really great. Like, this is what we want to happen. We want more and more people to you know, like us on TikTok and like other death doulas on Instagram and on Facebook. And we want people to be excited about having these conversations. At the collective, we really try really hard to push having people do their advanced care, you know, like directives, especially in COVID. It's been this thing where we've tried really hard to offer them free of charge to uh, BIPOC people, people of color, indigenous people, black people, the trans population, you know, all those minorities that are the minorities that we want to help because we have white privilege. Um, but I think that that speaks to the hopes for the, the larger community is just, you know, making it more and more and more accessible. That's a beautiful hope. Yeah. What I'm hearing you say is two things. One, uh, everyone needs to do their advanced directive. So if you're listening to this and you don't have it done, do it. <laughs> And if you have any influence on your circle of people, have them do it. <laughs> it's really important. It helps in the long run. It helps everybody. It helps the systems. It helps your family. It, it reduces a lot of trauma. Let's just, let's, yeah. I'm not even going to tiptoe around that. Just do it. Mm -hmm. I said it a lot nicer than I did. And then two, 
uh, I'll just put it out there. I'm going to move to Philly and everyone on the show can know that. And then I'm going to apply to this grief center for until I get a job. I have to get licensed there, but I mean, I can do this. Oh yeah, we can help you do that. Come on over. <laughs> Being a grief group facilitator was, it was my favorite job that I've ever had. And, and I just loved it so much. Um, I'm, yeah. I, yeah, I'm going to apply and apply <laughs> until you hire me. <laughs> so where can people find you? Well, we have Instagram at Philly Death Doulas. We are on Facebook. We are on TikTok. Come find us. Come follow us. We're always doing, trying to do educational stuff. We're always, you know, and anybody all over the world can join our death cafes or our death uh, or our grief circles. And if you don't follow them on Instagram and TikTok, you sh- you're you the only people. So if you're listening to this and you don't, you're the only ones that don't. And definitely <laughs> follow on TikTok because it's educational, entertaining, and inspiring. Thank you so much. Okay, this is amazing getting to know you and hearing your story yeah. and how you got here and what you're working towards. So yeah. thanks again to thank you. Kai. And thank you for listening. If you're listening to this on YouTube, please subscribe. That helps tell us to make more of this content and that you're interested in ethical end of life conversations. Then hop on over to Instagram and TikTok, follow us there. Thanks. And we will see you in the next episode.